well, thanks everybody for coming. So I guess what I'm going to talk about today, and I'll be happy to take questions on whatever's on your mind, is uh, the, the whole concept of Keynesianism and how uh, that theory is really responsible for uh, the problems uh, that we have, not only in America, but pretty much all around the world. It's almost universally accepted uh, that Keynes' philosophy was, was correct. And in fact, nothing about it is correct. It's that you know, we should you know, destroy all those Keynesian economic textbooks and uh, that you know, we not, should not be taught, I mean, if only as an example of, uh, of things that were, were, were wrong. But it, it is unfortunate as to how intoxicating the ideology is, and it certainly makes sense to me why our politicians would embrace the teachings of, of Keynes, because Keynes just justifies what politicians want to do anyway, which is spend more money. Uh, politicians want to get elected by promising uh, that they're going to improve our lives uh, by spending money, and, and Keynes basically validates that. It validates the role of government in trying to create growth or stimulate an economy. But the reality is the reverse. Government doesn't stimulate the economy, it, it sedates it. it, it gets in the way of growth, it doesn't create it. But Keynesianism makes good politics. It's you know, like the equivalent of you know, a fad diet, where there's no exercise required, you just take a pill or rub some ointment on and magically the, the pounds go away. You know, people want to accept that kind of pain-free, uh, simplistic solution to a problem. The politician promises that to make everything better uh, through spending money, cutting taxes, and running big deficits. I mean, that's a lot uh, more palatable to the, elect to the electorate than telling the truth uh, and you know, letting people know that there's not going to be any gain without any pain. And if you want to you know, lose weight, uh, these gimmicks aren't going to work. It's going to require a lot of diet. It's going to require exercise. Uh, you know, people don't want to hear that. You know, they, they want a simpler solution. But unfortunately, it doesn't work and it's produced uh, the, the crisis that we're in. So let, let's uh, take a step back for the U.S. and figure out how we got into the depression that we're now in. And I believe we are in a depression. It's going to last for a long time. And you know, the depression isn't here because of some failure of capitalism. If we had capitalism in America, there would be no depression. The reason that the depression is here and is going to stay here is because the government is in the way. The government is refusing to allow market forces to correct the problems in the U.S. economy that are the result of Keynesian monetary and fiscal stimulus. And because the government is going to keep repeating those mistakes, this depression is going to drag on and on and on, and it's going to keep getting worse. Because all of the policies that the government is using to stimulate the economy are stimulating the problems in the economy, and they're preventing those problems from being solved. See, in America, our problem is we borrow too much and, and we spend too much and we don't produce enough, we don't save enough. So you have these structural imbalances where we have this economy uh, that really cannot function unless the world subsidizes it. The world has to supply us with the money to spend and the goods to buy. And all we can do is borrow indefinitely without any hope of ever paying anybody back. And so we have this phony economy that's upside down that instead of being based on underconsumption, savings, investment, and production, is based on debt and debt to finance consumption, whether it's from the government or from individuals. And that is non-productive debt, and it's debt that can never be repaid because we are not uh, accumulating productive capacity uh, at, with that debt. We're simply blowing it on, on, on imported goods, and then when we look after we finish spending, we have to borrow more, but there's no way to pay it back. <coughs> But if you want to go back and see how the government created uh, this crisis, you, it, you can go back uh, to the 1990s. Of course, you can actually go back further than that, but it's only got an hour. But um, in the 1990s, we had a stock market bubble. And why we had that bubble, I think it was the result of continued uh, policies by the Greenspan Fed uh, to stimulate the economy through cheap money. Every time there was a problem anywhere in the world, whether it was uh, long-term capital management, uh, the bankruptcy of Orange County, the Russia uh, default, uh, Asian contagion, uh, Y2K, I mean, there was a number of different events you can remember from the 1990s. And every single time, there was Alan Greenspan with more money, pretty more money. Um, and of course, all that fed uh, the speculative mania uh, on Wall Street 
And when you combine that with the, the internet and the, the promise of the internet that you have this toxic mix of innovation and cheap money, and it produced this bubble, and you know you had Alan Greenspan and the idea that there was this Greenspan put. Everybody believed that Greenspan had their back, that the Fed would not let the market come down, that if anything went wrong, uh, so there was the moral hazard, which resulted in a lot of crazy risk taking that absent that Greenspan put and absent all that cheap money <clears throat> wouldn't have happened because people would have been more concerned about losses had they been more fearful of losses. But under the influence of all that cheap money and Alan Greenspan's assurances, uh, that fear went out the window and greed ran rapid on Wall Street. And we did a lot of very stupid things as a society in America in the 1990s. Now, Greenspan eventually took the punch bowl away, he raised interest rates, and the NASDAQ bubble burst. And that was kind of like a sobering moment where the stimulus high wears off and you know you, you realize what an idiot you were. I mean that's what happens when you get drunk, you drink alcohol, and you can do a lot of stupid things, and the following morning, you know, you, 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 how can I have done that? You know? Well, you were drunk. Uh, and then you sober up. And so we did a lot of stupid things. We we funded a lot of crazy internet companies uh, that had no chance of ever making any money. Uh, yet these companies were you know brought public. They rented office space, they hired workers, they bought all kinds of equipment. Of course, none of it they could afford. And when we sobered up with all the, you know, when the Fed uh, you know, took away the, the cheap money, we realized we made all these mistakes. And then the bubble burst and the recession began, which is the healing process. The, the recession is where we acknowledge the mistakes and then try to atone for them, try to correct them. So these dot-com companies go bankrupt, uh, their labor and capital are now released and to be reallocated in a more efficient, more productive manner. But during that process, uh, where asset prices are coming down and people are losing their jobs, that's a recession. And when George Bush inherited that recession from Bill Clinton, rather than laying the blame for the bust on Clinton, he simply tried to deal with the recession itself and tried to make it as shallow as possible. His whole goal was to fight the recession, even though the recession was the necessary cure for the problems that were in the economy. So instead of allowing this recession to do its work, uh, what did we do? We said we need stimulus. We need to stop the recession. The, the, real, the, the stock market bubble has burst. People are spending now because their stock market wealth has evaporated. Uh, what are we going to do? How can we get people to spend more money uh, even though they don't have it, you know what? You know, what can we do to, to stop this recession? And they slashed interest rates down to one percent, which was you know, really the lowest the Fed had ever brought them. We also had tax cuts, uh, so we had both uh, a fiscal stimulus by running a deficit and a monetary stimulus, um, and the result was the housing bubble. And this was not something that wasn't predictable. I started really writing about the housing bubble in 2004. I was worried about it in 2002 and 2003 when I saw what the Fed was doing. But it wasn't until 2004 that I realized that the enormity of, of the problem and, how, and the consequences when the bubble burst. And I started writing a lot of articles. I mean, there you can go read them on, on, uh, on my website, europac.net. But they're, you know, literally probably 20 or 30 articles that I wrote over a course of two or three years really outlining the, the problems in the housing market, exactly how it was being inflated, all the factors that were behind it, and, and more importantly, that when that bubble burst, the severity of the drop in housing prices and what it was going to mean to our financial institutions, to our banks, to Freddie and Fannie, I, you know, I pretty much laid out everything that was going to happen. Now, I didn't know for sure that the government was going to bail everybody out. I thought that was a potential. Uh, but I didn't know for sure. We, you know, we could have done the right thing and not bail people out, and it would have been an even bigger collapse uh, than the one that we had. But I outlined what was going to happen as a result of this housing bubble. But in any event, um, and also if you want to watch a really good presentation, because I don't guess we're not going to go over it all here, but if you go on the internet and you look at Peter Schiff Mortgage Bankers, you can look at a, a, an hour of presentation I gave on the real estate market to 3,000 mortgage bankers in 2006. And basically, I told them everything that was about to happen. Very few people believed me, uh, but it's all there. And if you if you actually watch that, I have yet to see a better explanation of, of, of what happened, even by people who were doing it after the fact, uh, than, than than the one I did, you know, before the fact. And I gave that presentation in 2005 as well, uh, so a year earlier. But anyway, so it was Keynesian stimulus 
monetary and fiscal, that caused the housing bubble. You know, and again, the two biggest factors were the cheap money. By driving interest rates down to 1%, they brought mortgage rates down. And it was low mortgage rates that enabled people to pay more and more for houses because people are buying houses based on the monthly payment. They don't really care about the price of the house. It's how much they're spending per month. And by bringing interest rates down, uh, they were able to spend less. And of course, since nobody really believed that rates would stay down forever, right, uh, the, the, the cheapest rates were these adjustable rate mortgages because the adjustable rate mortgages were based on where Alan Greenspan had short-term rates. So you could get, even when fixed rate mortgages were 6%, you could get an adjustable rate mortgage at 2 or 3%. And so a lot of people who couldn't afford the 6% were buying using an adjustable rate of 2 or 3%. And the government, through Freddie and Fannie, was guaranteeing those mortgages, even though the government knew that when interest rates rose, the person who was borrowing couldn't afford to pay. But nobody cared because everybody just simply believed that real estate prices would always rise. So it really didn't matter if you can afford to make the payments for two or three years because you would just sell for a profit or you would refinance into some other loan that you could afford. But this was all made possible by Alan Greenspan. In addition, of course, you had the Freddie and Fannie guarantees. The private sector never would have made these loans if the government wasn't guaranteeing them. Uh, so that was a huge problem. And of course, the loans that the government didn't guarantee, which were the, uh, the, um, the subprime loans, Freddie and Fannie was the single biggest buyer in the market. And so Freddie and Fannie was creating demand for the products that Wall Street was securitizing. And of course, the real demand also was coming from institutions all around the world who had huge dollars to recirculate from enormous trade deficits that were a direct consequence of the Fed's cheap money policy. So we were exporting all these dollars. Our trade deficit went to record highs during that period. I think we had we were having monthly deficits of over seventy billion dollars. So we were we were we were flooding the world with our money. Alan Greenspan had interest rates at one percent. So our creditors were looking for a way to recycle those trade surpluses. After all, we didn't produce much. So uh, they were looking for things to buy, and Wall Street created these mortgage products uh, that, of course, the rating agencies put high ratings on, and so our creditors were gobbling them up. But all the demand was coming from all the money that we were flooding the world based on cheap credit. And at the time, I was challenging, if you look at that mortgage banker speech, I knew that these bonds that were being rated AAA were going to fail. I knew that they weren't even, they, I said they should be rated F. Uh, but this is, all this was going on, and some people might blame, well, you can blame you know, capitalism because of uh, the, the poor ratings, although the government uh, only, you know, the government is regulating these rating agencies and the government is limiting competition among rating agencies. But even though the private sector did make some mistakes, just like they made mistakes uh, during the, the, the stock market bubble, the question is why? What led so many rational people to make so many foolish decisions at the same time? You know, George Bush, when he was president, he said that Wall Street got drunk. And I agree with him. I said, yeah, they were drunk. But the question was, why? You know, where did they get all that alcohol? You know, they got it from the Federal Reserve. And so you can't, you can't separate the monetary policy from the consequences. And you, have, you can't just blame Wall Street for doing stupid things under the influence of all that cheap money. If you took away that influence, if, you, if, if, if Gavin Greenspan wasn't pouring the alcohol, everybody would have been sober and we wouldn't have had this problem. But unfortunately, and one of the things I did forecast, even in my book Crash Proof, is I was afraid that when the real estate bubble burst and the recession ensued, which I believe would be the worst since the Great Depression, and that was an accurate forecast, my fear was that capitalism would take the blame. Because usually when government interferes with capitalism and creates a problem, it's always capitalism that gets the blame, not the government interference. And then that gives the government the ability to say, you see, we told you you can't trust capitalism. We need even more regulations. And then the government uses that crisis as an opportunity to get even bigger and then do even more damage. And if you, you know, talk uh, to most people, I did a radio show earlier this morning here, uh, and uh, the one caller that called in said, oh, you're wrong, you know, Peter, that you know, this is all because of not enough regulation. It was just unbridled capitalism. If we just had more regulations, we wouldn't have had this financial crisis. That is the conventional wisdom, and that is the result of a probably good propaganda effort by the government to get people to believe 
that the crisis was caused by a lack of government. You know, we actually had the U.S. government convened a commission and before Congress, a committee, to try to find out why there was a financial crisis. And I remember thinking, gee, you know, since I wrote a book predicting the financial crisis, since I've been going on television for two or three years warning about the financial crisis, this is a perfect committee for me to testify in front of. Because after all, I predicted it, so if you want to know why there's a financial crisis, just ask me. And I'll tell you. In fact, you don't even have to ask me. You can spend $19 and buy my book. You know, it would have been a lot cheaper than this million-dollar commission that they convened. But out of, I don't know how many witnesses they had, 100 or 200 witnesses, they would not, I, they didn't test, they didn't, they didn't permit me to testify. In fact, not a single witness who testified predicted the crisis. And in fact, every witness who testified came to the same conclusion. It was the fault of capitalism and we need more government. And so it was, you know, they had a pre, uh, a, a determined, preconceived conclusion that they just wanted to support by bringing in witnesses that would help them arrive at that predetermined conclusion. They didn't want to hear an honest assessment of why there was a financial crisis. They simply wanted to use the financial crisis as an excuse to pass Dodd-Frank and to grow the size of government. But the problem is the Federal Reserve is still there. And in fact, it's doing more damage now than ever. Fannie and Freddie are still there, as is the FHA, guaranteeing more mortgages than ever and on, you know, on shakier terms than ever. So all the things that the government did to distort the housing market and to distort the free market, they're still doing it. So we haven't reined in any of the excesses in government, and so we haven't solved any of the problems. Now, where are we today? So we had a housing bubble because the Fed kept interest rates too low for too long. What is the solution that we are now pursuing under Fed Bernanke? The exact same policy. In order to stimulate us out of the recession that resulted from the bursting of the stock market bubble, we brought interest rates down to 1%. In order to stimulate the economy out of the recession that resulted from the collapse of the real estate bubble, we brought interest rates down to zero. And the, the fiscal stimulus is far greater than what we had under, um, under, uh, under Bush. Instead of running a $300 billion deficit or whatever it was, now it's a $1.5 trillion a year deficit. So we, we haven't just doubled down on these, prop, on these policies. We've what, uh, quintupled down on them. And what is the result? Well, the, the, uh, the phony recovery that we had under the Bush administration and Greenspan, that lasted about four or five years. So we had four or five years of false prosperity, and then we paid for it when, when the bubble burst. Now, would we have been much better off had we had, not had that phony prosperity? Had we simply allowed a deeper recession to take place uh, during the earlier part of that decade? Of course. You know, during that recessionary period, that short, shallow recession, consumers actually took on debt. They ended the recession with more debt than it began in. During that recession, we had record car sales and record home sales. It doesn't sound like a, a, a cleansing recession where you know, you're, you're having record amounts of spending and going deeper into debt. So had we had a more severe recession in 2001, 2002, then we never would have had a housing bubble. Clearly, we would be better off now had we taken a little more pain back then. But did we learn from that? No. We're doing the exact same thing. We are refusing to allow the market to repair the damage done by that housing bubble, done by all the excess consumption. Think about all the money that Americans spent that they didn't have based on the expectation that their house would go up in value forever. People decided they didn't have to save. Uh, they lever up. They bought all sorts of things. We ran the, you know, the trade decks that went through the through the through the, uh, through the roof. We we made a, we, we did a lot of stupid things uh, because we thought we all won the lottery. And when we realized that we you know we didn't, we had to go through a big recession. And now not only did we have to restore the damage from this recession, but we still had to deal with what what the problems from the the last one from that stock market bubble that we never fully resolved because the government interfered with the process. So we're we're in a much deeper hole now. But now what? So instead of learning from our mistakes, we repeat them on a bigger scale. But what, have, what did we get to show for it? This time we didn't even get you know, you know, four or five years of false prosperity. We're already on the verge of the next recession if it hasn't already started. What did we get? We got two or three years of barely any kind of growth. And I don't think we actually had any economic growth. We got the GDP to go up. Yeah, because we borrowed a bunch of money and spent it. And as you spend borrowed money, 
that makes the GDP go up. But the problem is when you have to pay it back, that makes the GDP go down. Plus you got interest to deal with. That makes it worse. And of course, I just saw they came up with statistics, um, I think earlier this week, that during the time period of the recession, which, which officially went from December 2007 through um, June of 2009, during that period, U.S. household income adjusted for inflation dropped by 3.5% during, during the recession. And of course, it actually dropped more than that because the government's measures of inflation are inaccurate. I think inflation is a lot higher than the official estimates reveal. But even if you use the government's numbers, household income dropped by 3.5% during the recession. During the recovery, which started supposedly in June of 2009 up until today, household income has dropped 7.5%. It is additional. So how is it that American families are doing worse in the recovery than they did during the recession? Maybe it's because we don't even have a recovery. The whole thing is phony. I think that we've had so much government stimulus that doesn't work anymore. That we've built up a tolerance and all we're going to get is an overdose now. We're not going to get the high that we used to get. Yes, it worked for a while. It worked in the 90s because we built up a, a, a stock market bubble, and we had a lot of phony wealth in the stock market we could all spend. And then it worked in the, in the housing bubble, but it ain't working now because we're not getting another housing bubble. We're not getting another stock market bubble. So we're not getting all this phony wealth that we can spend. What are we getting for all this stimulus? More government. That is the new bubble. It's in government. All the cheap money of the 90s went into the stock market. In the 2000s, it went into the real estate market. Where is it going now? It's going into more and bigger government. The size of the government has exploded. I mean, the government is spending almost $4 trillion a year. It's twice, you know, in 2000, when the decade began, I think the budget was $2 trillion or even less. It was one point something. So we basically doubled the size of the government, and all this money is just going into that. And so we, we, we got something to show for the stock market bubble. We got something to show for the real estate bubble. We're going to get nothing to show. For the government bubble. Although one of the funny things about some of the Keynesians, and even Alan Greenspan is signing on to this, is that people are actually saying that the way we solve the problem in the housing market is for the government to buy up all the houses and destroy them. <laughs> and, and if we did that, we would really have nothing to show for the housing bubble. Because for all the problems in the housing bubble, at least we got the houses. Yeah, it would have been better off if we did something else because we built houses we really didn't need, but now that they're there, I mean, destroying them would mean we got nothing to show for the housing bubble. I mean, yes, now that they're there, we can live in them. That's one problem we don't have now in America is housing. We got plenty of houses. We got other problems. But if we destroy those houses, then housing will become a problem too. They're, the whole idea is, well, we need to we need to destroy houses so that the prices won't go down. Well, well what's wrong with housing prices coming down? That means housing is more affordable for people. You know, if we had cheaper housing, that's a good thing. You know, and if destroying some houses is a good idea, then why don't we destroy them all? Well, gee, that would really be an economic boom then, right? We'd have no place to live. We'd really have to start working hard to replace those houses. The whole thing is nonsense. This is the Keynesian, the Keynesian uh, uh, mentality. And, and, and what is really behind we get all this effort is we've got to get people spending. People have to spend. No, they don't. Americans aren't spending because they're broke. And some Keynesians will acknowledge, yes, Americans are too broke to spend, so the government should do it. But where's the government going to get the money? If the people are broke, the government is broke. Because the government's not going to get the money from you know, outer space. You know, it's got to get it from American citizens. Now, it can temporarily borrow it from the rest of the world, but ultimately it's the American citizens that have to pay those debts off. And if Americans are broke, how can we pay the debts? How can we go deeper into debt if we already can't pay the debts that we have? The truth of the matter is we're in trouble because we borrowed and spent too much money. Borrowing and spending more is not the way out. It's the opposite. We have to stop spending. Not just individuals, but the government. Everybody has to stop spending because that's the only way we can start saving. You can't spend and save simultaneously. And what happens if we save? Well, if we save and Americans put money in the bank, now there's money available for businesses. Businesses can use that money to buy equipment, to make investments, to hire people, to produce things. That's what we have to do. We have to save and produce our way out of this crisis. 
We can't get out of the hole by digging it deeper, but it's never going to happen because everything the U.S. government is doing is preventing that from happening. The minute anybody tries to save, it's a national crisis. We have to do something about it. We need a stimulus. We can't have anybody saving. We need spending. And it's the whole idea is that economies are driven by spending, but that is putting the cart before the horse. It's production that makes spending possible. You don't have any demand unless you have supply. I mean, in a sense, there's demand in that you have desire, which is infinite. I mean, the government never has to stimulate demand. I mean, everybody wants everything. What stops people from buying is they can't afford it. Right? I have a, a nine-year-old son. I mean, he wants everything he sees. I don't, I don't have to stimulate it. I have to let him know you can't have everything you want. <laughs> but what you need is production. And the government can't create production by printing money. You know, all it does is printing money is drive up the price of what's already been produced. So we have, we, we have to recognize the, 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 the cause of these problems. And, and if we don't, we're never going to solve them. And I know that we can't solve our economic problems in America until interest rates go up. If you understand that the problem is we don't save enough and we borrow too much, what is behind all that? It's interest rates. Because interest rates are being set by government. They're not being set by the free market. The Federal Reserve says, here's where interest rates are. And right now they say interest rates should be zero. Well, obviously they shouldn't be that low. But clearly, if they're zero, nobody is going to save. And people are going to borrow. But the thing is, all this cheap money that's available, it's not available to small businesses. They can't sell bonds. They can't borrow at the discount window. The cheap money is benefiting Wall Street that can speculate with it. It's benefiting the government or major corporations that can refinance debt uh, through the bond market. But that isn't generating wealth. It's not creating jobs. The companies that need credit can't get it because it's not there. Or the government is guaranteeing student loans or they're guaranteeing a mortgage debt. We need legitimate savings. So it goes to the hands of the entrepreneur not the speculator, not the financier. And where is all that savings coming from? It's just being created in a thin air. So it's not real. It's simply you know, the government is debasing the money. They're robbing the purchasing power from Main Street and redirecting it through the banks and through Wall Street. And that's why you see here in America now we've got these protests, Occupy Wall Street. People are furious at what's happening. But again, they're blaming the wrong people. They're blaming capitalism for a problem created by government. They're occupying Wall Street when they should be occupying Washington. They should be protesting the Fed. They should be protesting Congress, the President, the Supreme Court. These are the, the institutions that are failing America, not, not corporations or Wall Street. I mean, I don't blame any Wall Street bank for taking a bailout. I would have taken it. I blame the government for giving it to them. The government should have let all the banks that bet wrong fail. They should have let the people that loaned them the money lose their money. They should have allowed the creditors to lose money. But the government didn't do that. That's not capitalism. And when you see these protesters protesting the bailouts and protesting capitalism, that's not capitalism. Capitalism would have let them fail. They're protesting the opposite of capitalism. What they really want, whether they know or not, is they want capitalism. They're arguing in favor of capitalism and against what our country has become, crony capitalism, fascism, socialism, corporatism, however you want to label it. But the one way I know you can't label it is capitalism, because that's what it's not. So I said the way to solve our problems, we need higher interest rates. Well, we're not going to get them. They're at zero. And here is the problem, and, and this is where the real crisis is coming. You know, when I wrote my book, Crash Proof, the, the crisis that I was forecasting is not the one that happened in 2008. I forecast that one. But I said that wasn't the crisis. That was the event that was going to start the crisis. Because I said the crisis was not going to result from the bursting of the housing bubble and from the ensuing recession and bank failures. I said the crisis would result from what the government does to solve that problem. So I said the U.S. economy would die not from the disease, but from the government cure. And that crash is still coming, and in fact it might come as soon as next year. And, 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 and the way that crash is going to play out, it's going to be the form of a sovereign debt, a currency crisis in the United States. You know, we're seeing it right now uh, in Europe, where nations are being held to account for having too much debt. And this process is not going to stop 
in uh, Greece or Ireland. It's going to come across the Atlantic and it's going to end in America because we are the biggest offenders when it comes to uh, debt and living beyond our means. And we're not going to escape this without having to deal with it with a, with a day of reckoning. And if you remember, when the, um, the, the mortgage crisis first began, and it was the subprime market where you first saw the cracks and you saw the problems, just about everybody, you know, in, in Wall Street, in Washington, I remember Ken Paulson, uh, uh, Ben Ber 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 Bernanke, all the big people were saying not to worry, subprime is contained, it's just this small little segment of the market, the housing market is, is fine, don't worry about it. Now I of course was on television at the same time saying that's not true, uh, this is just the beginning, it's the tip of an iceberg, it's not a subprime problem, it is a mortgage problem. Yes, you're seeing it in the subprime first, but just wait a little while and you'll see that the sickness permeates the entire uh, mortgage market and this is a major, major problem. It's going to be huge. Of course, I was right about that. It's the same situation with sovereign debt. All the experts that said don't worry about the mortgages, they're also saying, hey, don't worry about the sovereign issues. Uh, it's not going to come to America. I mean, it's just these subprime, these big countries, but America is immune. We don't have to worry because we've got a printing press. As if somehow having a printing press is going to be comfort to our creditors when we actually use it uh, to pay off our liabilities. Yes, we don't have the default in a technical sense of the word. We can give everybody back their dollars, but when they can't buy very much or anything with those dollars, it's going to be a little comfort uh, that we pay. But I think that we are working our way up the food chain and we're going to deal with this sovereign debt issue. I think right now, the fact that Europe is dealing with their problems first is buying us some time. You know, unfortunately, we're not using that time wisely. In fact, it's just extra rope that we're using to hang ourselves because since we are benefiting from Europe's problems in that it is keeping treasuries low and the dollar higher, it is simply enabling the U.S. government to postpone making necessary cuts in spending because they can borrow the money instead. And they can only do it because rates are low, which really gets to, to the heart of the problem in that America itself as a nation is making the exact same mistake that the subprime buyers made in the real estate market. We are borrowing money because it's cheap. And we're borrowing short. We are not selling a lot of 30-year treasuries or even 10-year treasuries. The majority of the money the federal government is borrowing to finance the debt matures in under a year or you know, short term. It might be two or three years on half of it, but I think a third of it matures in a year or less of the whole, entire national debt. So in other words, we have a, an adjustable rate mortgage on the national debt and interest rates are at historic lows. What happens when interest rates rise? Well, we're in the same predicament as the mortgage borrower. We can't afford those higher rates, not legitimately. We can't raise taxes uh, to cover it. All we can do is just print even more money. And that's what I think we're going to do. But that is what precipitates a crisis. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to play out like this. You're going to start to see a drop in the dollar. A dollar index is going to crack through uh, record lows. It's going to start to put upward pressure on, on interest rates. It, but, but it's definitely going to put upward pressure on consumer prices. And you're going to see uh, consumer prices, which are right now, year on year, the government is acknowledging a 3.8% inflation rate, which again, it's much higher than that. But pretty soon the government is going to have to start acknowledging inflation rates north of 5%. And then what is the Fed going to do about it? Is the Fed going to continue to pretend that there's no inflation? It might be able to do that for a little while, but then it loses any credibility that it has left. Well, I don't know why it, it still has any. Uh, if it doesn't raise rates, to try to combat that or to try to put a floor beneath the dollar, which will be, of course, falling. Or the Fed is going to raise interest rates to try to fight off the inflation, but the minute they do that, then they're going to bring on a financial collapse much greater than what happened in 2008, because then the bailouts are off the table, because the Fed can't be easing and tightening, tightening simultaneously. So if the Fed decides to tighten, then it can't bail anybody out, which means the banks are going to fail, uh, the government is going to have to restructure its debt, meaning it doesn't pay 100 cents on the dollar. We're going to have to go through an enormous uh, decline, which of course is a positive, is a step in the right direction. We have to do that anyway. But the question is politically, 
Is the Fed going to do that? Are they going to let the banks fail? And the reason I'm saying the banks are going to fail, if interest rates go up, the banks are, you know, the banks are toast. I mean, think about the balance sheet of a typical bank. The banks have a lot of long-term, low-yielding debt, whether it's mortgages or government debt. When interest rates go up, the value of those assets plunge. In addition, how are banks making money? They're borrowing from the Fed and they're investing in these assets. Well, when interest rates go up, the profits turn to losses. Uh, so the banks are insolvent. Meantime, when the economy turns down, commercial real estate really gets hit. Uh, all their portfolios of, 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 of commercial real estate, their, their home equity loans, their second mortgages, I mean, all this stuff is going to get clobbered. I mean, the banks, if, if we have a situation where the U.S. country is over levered, where Americans have borrowed too much, they're loaded up with credit card debt, student loans, auto loans, home mortgages, and no jobs, no way of paying it back, obviously the losses are going to hit the people that loan them the money. One way or another, one way or another, the creditors are going to lose. Either they're not going to get paid back, or they're going to get paid back in money that has very little value. Those are the only options. There's no way they can be paid back in legitimate money. So the question is, you know, which, which path will the government choose? Will it decide to try to postpone the pain for a while longer and destroy the dollar, destroy the U.S. currency, and ultimately obliterate our economy even worse? Or will, will we finally bite the bullet, acknowledge all the mistakes, raise interest rates, and let the chips fall where they may? But either one of those two scenarios is going to take place. And either way, we are going to get a real economic crisis, a real financial crisis in the United States, not what happened in 2008. And there is no bailout waiting for us. Uh, you know, we don't have a, a European Union that's going to come to the rescue uh, like we might have for, for Greece. And the problem is, we have already had countries that have been bailing us out. Look at China. China has over $2 trillion of our debt. That's a $2 trillion subsidy that the Chinese have already supplied the American economy. How much more are they going to give? We just voted in, uh, in the Senate to potentially put some kind of punitive tariffs on China. I don't actually think for a minute that we would do it. I mean, we're not that stupid. But China is you know, one of the biggest um, uh, 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 they're, they're bearing the lion's share of the burden of propping up the U.S. economy because they're supplying us uh, with all this cheap money and they're supplying us with the merchandise. I mean, imagine where America would be if China wasn't there. Imagine how much higher prices would be for American consumers. Imagine how much higher interest rates would be for American debtors and for the government. So we need China. Of course, China doesn't need us. And the danger is that they figure that out, that they figure out that if they just let the dollar collapse, then they won't need our export market because their own citizens will be rich enough to buy their own products. Because when the RMB goes up, that creates purchasing power in China. And you know the Chinese are going to be better off <coughs> if they can consume their goods rather than just send them to us and get stacks of paper that they can't do anything with. Right now, that's all they do is they, they stack dollar bills, but they'd be much better off if they actually got the enjoyment that we're now getting uh, from all the products that their efforts are producing. Because right now, we get the fruits of their labor, and, and they, get, they, get a, they get a piece of paper. So I don't think that China or the rest of the world is going to be in a position to give us an additional bailout when they're already you know, suffering the consequences of all the money that they've already spent bailing us out. You know, we have exported our bad monetary policy all around the world. I mean, China is suffering now inflation because of their currency peg, and they might try you know, to uh, combat it uh, with uh, higher reserve requirements or higher rates, but none of that's going to work. As long as they're printing RMB to buy dollars, they're going to have inflation. And the only way to solve the problem is to stop creating it. They can't do that unless they let their currency go up. And I think that this is going to happen, that countries are going to uh, back away from buying our debt. Uh, and then, you know, it's, it's just up to America. There's no Marshall Plan for the United States. So either we confront these problems in a realistic way, which means rejecting all the tenets of Keynesianism, allowing you know, uh, uh, the prices to fall, real estate prices, stock prices to fall, allow Americans to rebuild savings, to go back to sound money. It'd be great if we could go back on a gold standard, but even if we don't, we've got to let interest rates go up dramatically in this country and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and allow you know, a, a pool of savings to rebuild. And of course, if we're going to start producing, one of the other problems that we now have in America is that we have burdened industry with, with so much regulations and, 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 and onerous taxation and even beyond that, the litigation 
I mean, one of the one of the riskiest things that you can do in America is employ somebody. It's very it's very risky to hire people, uh, and there are many ways that you can get sued uh, if uh, you know if the government determines that you didn't hire them the proper way or you didn't treat them the proper way. Uh, so it, it, a lot of businesses just try their best not to hire anybody, or if they hire somebody, they want to minimize the number of people they hire because they need to minimize that risk. They need to minimize that liability. If you can outsource the job, that's what you do. If you can, if you can automate and replace a human being with a machine, that's what you do. So we're going to have to change all those rules and regulations because there's going to be a lot of Americans who are unemployed uh, as a result of what's going to happen. And if we're going to put them to work productively, the government's going to have to get out of the way and, and let it happen. And it also means like a lot of other uh, you know, conventional myths you know, or, or are, are going to have to go away. Like everybody has to go to college. I mean, unfortunately, everybody doesn't have to go to college. There are a lot of people that would be better off without going to college. And the biggest problem, too, with everyone going to college is the tuitions are, are, are through the roof. And we have Americans now that are graduating with four-year degrees. Of course, now it takes five or six years to get those degrees. But you get out of college and you have $100,000 of debt. You have $200,000 of debt. And you're no more qualified to do a job than somebody who hasn't even gone to college. A lot of times they major in things that are completely irrelevant and give them no real job skills. But it doesn't matter because you know they were able to get a government guaranteed loan, and and so they can pay some inflated tuition to get a worthless degree. We don't have the resources anymore to spend all this money, basically sending our kids to five or six years, you know, of, of, of summer camp, and and then. You know, they graduated debt. We can't do that. We have to. We have to let the market bring down those prices. We have to do the same thing in healthcare. We were, we, we've got so much of the American economy now devoted to healthcare because of all these government subsidies, and and that's why it's so expensive. We have to deal with that. And all this stuff uh, can be dealt with if uh, we we go back to free market principles. If we can get the government out of the economy, out of micromanage the economy, and we can go back to free market capitalism. And we are in a gigantic hole. There's no question about it. Years and years of this Keynesian policy and, and, and cheap money has destroyed what was a once mighty industrial economy. There's no question that we are in a gigantic hole. But I also know that we can get out of it. I mean, there have been countries that were in worse shape. I mean, look at the, the problems that of, of Germany or Japan at the end of the Second World War. I mean, those countries came back I mean, they were, you know, I mean, imagine what their, their countries, the shape that they were in after they lost those wars. True, we, we, we helped them a bit, but what really helped them was, was, was capitalism. Uh, yeah, and, and, and so it's going to work in America. You know, I made the comment that, you know, capitalism is doing really, really well in China. Uh, and I'm sure if we tried it in America, it would work just as well here. <laughs> in fact, it might work even better. Uh, but anyway, I, want, I don't know if sure, I've been speaking for an hour yet, but I want to, you know, John, I'll open it up to some questions uh, if, I can, if anybody has any. Yeah. Uh, my name is Peter White. Thank you very much for a, a very stimulating talk. Uh, you seem to be saying that bad government policy can't trump fundamental market forces forever. But Washington seems to be saying, yes, it can. And the policy mindset in Washington is just kick the can down the road, and we can keep doing that forever. And most of us will be gone in four years. There'll be another bunch of guys. And they won't be responsible, and so on. We we'll just keep kicking the can down the road. Yeah. So, well, what, just uh, one more gloss to that. So, is there really going to be end to this process? And then, if you're right that the current bubble is a government bubble, how will that burst? Will that be sovereign debt default? Yeah. First of all, the problem with kicking the can down the road is eventually you run out of road. And I think we're at that. I mean, yes, they're going to try to do it. I mean, no politician is going to confront an issue like this until there's a crisis. Because after all, let's try to postpone it so we don't have to deal with it. Because they're thinking of it in, in terms of politics. I want to get reelected, and I'm not going to get reelected by leveling with the public and letting them know how bad it is. They want a government fix. So, yes, but you run out of room. I mean, I don't think there is a lot of asphalt in front of us. It's all behind us. And so we're going to have to deal with this relatively soon, despite the fact that the politicians don't want to. But that's why I think it's going to be a crisis to get us to do it. And yes, in answer to the second part of your question, the bursting of the government bubble is a sovereign debt. I and mean, you see the, the, the evidence of the government bubble in the bond market. I mean, look at the yield on 30-year U.S. Treasuries at, um, what, 3% or something like that, and 
the 10 year is just over 2%. It actually got down as low as 1.7 last week. You know, is anybody who in their right mind would loan money to the US government for 10 years for 1.7%? Nobody would do that. In fact, nobody is buying a 10 year treasury to clip coupons and redeem it in 10 years. Everybody who is buying that bond is buying it with the intention of selling it before maturity. The question is to who? Who's going to buy it when everybody wants to sell? It's the same thing as people who are flipping condos in Las Vegas. People were buying condos without ever having the intention of moving in. The intention was to sell it to somebody else who also had no intention of moving in. But at some point, someone has to live in that condo. So at some point, somebody's got to be willing to hold that bond to maturity. And you know, so somebody's going to get hit with these losses. And at some point, you know, people are going to stop buying. Now, a lot of the buying of U.S. Treasuries is coming from foreign central banks. So, you know, they're not buying for economic reasons. They're buying for political reasons. China says it's in their political interest to show up at our auctions and buy our treasuries. It doesn't matter to China whether it's a good investment or not. They're doing it because of political considerations. But the political winds can change. China can decide it's not in our interest to buy these bonds, and then we're not buying them. And, and so the people, the, the buyers are going to go away, and ultimately the only buyer that's left is the Fed. But when people realize that the Fed is the only buyer, that's it, it's over. And of course, because the minute they see that, then everybody wants out of dollars. And it doesn't matter if the Fed is buying treasuries, I don't want corporates, I don't want muties, I don't want any debt denominated in dollars. Because if you see the Fed is printing all this money, the dollar is going to be losing a lot of value. It's going to be losing a lot more value than the interest rates. No one's going to want to buy you know, a, uh, um, a General Electric bond that pays 7% if inflation is 15%. So then, you know, so, and then the Fed, if the Fed wants to maintain this game, then it has to expand its quantitative easing. It has to start buying everything. It has to buy those GE bonds unless it wants to watch the yields go up to 20 or 30%. It's got to buy the muni bonds uh, from the state. It's going to have to buy everything. And then, and then, and then what do you have? Right? You get Zimbabwe if the Fed is the only buyer of all the debt. So at some point, it has to stop. At some point, we have to make a decision. You know, what, what, what fate do we want? I mean, are we really going to destroy the dollar? I mean, there probably are some people that think that we can create just enough inflation uh, to ease the debt. That maybe if we just uh, destroy half the value of the dollar over the next five years, or that we can reduce half the value of the debt. It's not going to work. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, the, the government is not that precise. Or it, 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 and, and even if that, it could work. I mean, that's still, if our creditors realize that that's what we're going to do, they're not going to sit and ride that down over the next five years. They're going to get out. When people figure out that our policy is to, is to have the value of the dollar, they're not going to ride it down. So you can't have this orderly decline of the dollar because it, it'll become disorderly as soon as people rise up to what's going on. So the, we're going to get this crisis. And, 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 you know, and the, 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 uh, the government debt bubble is, you know, the government is spending all this money. You know, now what is, Obama, they want to spend more. They want to have a gigantic infrastructure program. I mean, we're broke. How are we going to afford this infrastructure? You know, I say it's like somebody loses their job and they decide that they're going to put in a swimming pool. You know, yeah, it's nice to have a swimming pool, but then if you're if you're broke, you really can't afford to do that. You got you got to do something else. Yes, it would be nice if we had prettier roads and nicer schools, but you know what? We don't have the money, and it doesn't stimulate the economy to fix up the schools, right? Just because you create a job. Uh, by somebody working in a school. Where'd the resources come from? Where'd the money come from? What are we doing because we're building that school? Maybe what we're not building is building a factory somewhere that we really need to build because we have to produce. You know, ultimately, the government can create a lot of work. Right? The government can create work for everybody, but it can't create real productive jobs. Right? Everybody in the Soviet Union had a job. Nobody was unemployed in the Soviet Union. But you know, so you but you had to wait in line what eight hours to buy a loaf of bread because everybody was employed, but nobody was baking bread, right? So we need people employed productively, not just in government jobs because government jobs don't produce. In fact, government jobs make everybody else less productive. I don't know if we have anyone here working for the government, but the private sector has to pay their salaries. The money that we send to Washington in America is the money that we can't use to invest or grow the economy. And, and, and when someone from the government, when the government worker spends their paycheck, 
What are they buying? They're buying all the stuff that was produced by the private sector. So we're supporting government workers, and any resources that the government takes from the private sector are diminishing economic growth. Yes, you can see, you can see the guys getting a government paycheck. Yes, we have this stimulus project to, you know, to build this bridge, and here's 10,000 people who are working on this project. Okay, well, where are the 10,000 people that lost their jobs so that these 10,000 people can have a job? And, you know, what is, and do we need this bridge? You know, the government says it doesn't even matter. Even if we build a bridge to nowhere, the key is just to build a bridge. And of course it matters. I mean, infrastructure spending can be a be benefit, but only if, it's, if, it's, if it raises our productivity. Yes, if building a bridge in a particular area ultimately raises our productivity because it makes transportation costs lower, because now we can go straight on this bridge instead of like taking a longer trip, then yes, that investment in infrastructure can help the economy but only in the long run, when the returns start to roll in. In the short run, the expense of the investment is a burden on the economy. We need the resources. We need to have the freed up resources to build that bridge. The payback comes in the long run. Now that doesn't mean we should do the investments. Obviously, if there's a payback, we should make it. But to say that we can stimulate the economy in the short run by doing it is false. But yet, yeah, the government wants to try to do this, wants to try to spend more money when it's broke. And of course, how does it want to finance the infrastructure? It wants to issue more debt. Well, that bubble is going to burst because pretty soon the lenders are going to say, we don't want a loan. You know, in Greece, there, nobody was talking really about Greek debt a couple of years ago. The debt was there, but nobody was worried about it. And the Greek government was able to pay it because the interest rates were low. All of a sudden, people start to say, you know, they owe, us, they owe a lot of money in Greece. Maybe they can't pay it all back. And then the lenders get worried and they don't want to buy the bonds anymore. And so interest rates start to go up. And now the government is, oh, we, they can't afford to pay the higher rates. The same thing is going to happen in America. People are going to wake up and realize that <coughs> we're broke, we can't pay this money back, and they don't want our debt. And then rates start to go up, and then we can't service the debt that exists. And then it's a self-perpetuating prophecy. We're running a gigantic Ponzi scheme. And if you don't think we're running a Ponzi scheme, our politicians acknowledge that in the most recent uh, debate over raising the debt ceiling. Remember what President Obama said? Remember what the Secretary of the Treasury said, Timothy Geithner? If we don't raise the debt ceiling, we're going to default on our debts. There you go. It's a Ponzi scheme. The, the Treasury told our creditors that you are the low man on the totem pole. That if we can't borrow more money, we're not going to pay you back the money you've already loaned us. Now, remember, this is what we said would happen if we imposed our own lending standard. Because the debt ceiling is a self-imposed limit. But think about it this way. What are we going to tell the world if the world says, we're not going to lend you any more money anymore? Well, OK, then we're not going to pay you back the money you've already loaned us. That is a Ponzi scheme. America will pay interest on its debt as long as it can borrow more money to do it. And we will pay principal on our debt as long as somebody will loan us the money to repay that principal. But the minute people stop loaning us money, we're not paying anybody. That's exactly what Bernie Madoff did. There is no difference. Time for one more question. Oh, uh, there's a lot of questions. Let's go for a few minutes. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, why did you set up uh, an office in Montreal, and how do you see the Canadian situation? Well, we we had a couple of individuals here in Montreal that wanted to join the firm. They lived in Montreal, had a pretty good big, good book of business, and so it seemed like a good opportunity. Uh, to have a Montreal office. We started in Toronto. But the reason that I you know, expanded up into Canada was because I had been developing quite a following up here in Canada. A lot of people in Canada were reading my work. Uh, they were seeing me on television. They were following me on the internet. So I began to develop a pretty good following up here. And I thought that that was a good market potential for people who also might want to utilize my brokerage services. And since, you know, again, this is part of the problem with government regulations, because of the security regulators, I'm not allowed, as an American brokerage firm, to take an account for somebody who lives in Canada. So people would call me up and they'd say, hey, I'd like to open up an account with you. Well, I'm sorry, uh, government rules say I can't do business with you. Uh, so, you know, we ended up opening up a firm uh, in Canada so that we can comply with the laws so that Canadians can legally uh, do business with me only they're not doing business with me directly, they're doing it indirectly through a firm with which I have an ownership interest and which follows my investment philosophy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
And uh, what about the Canadian situation? What about? Well, how do you see the future? Like, uh, are we? Uh, uh, no, well, I mean, Canada, Canada is not in the predicament of America. America is unique in the structure of its economy. I mean, if Canada had been issuing the world's reserve currency for 50 years, you'd probably be just as screwed as we are. <laughs> but, you know, the world gave us a lot of rope, right? And so we hung ourselves with it. Canada didn't get all that rope. In fact, you guys were in trouble a while ago, and you dealt with it. You know, because, you know, you had no choice. Politicians had to start cutting back because the Canadian dollar was going down. Uh, you know, there were some people were starting to realize that, hey, you know, every country, New Zealand has done it, you know, Sweden has done it, I and mean, a lot of countries that had too much government had to change. They had no choice. America hasn't had to make that decision yet because we've had a choice. Keep borrowing. The world will let us do it. And so we've developed this crazy economy that no one else can have, an economy that's totally dependent on foreign capital, on foreign money so that we can spend, and on foreign goods so that we have something to buy. And so we've been able to run an economy that's basically a service sector. But you know, it's really easy to run an economy when you don't need factories. You know, when you don't need all that equipment. I mean, think, all we have to do is have a, open up a storefront and put a cash register in there. And that's, that's all we do. I and mean, all we do is sell all the stuff that everybody else makes. But you know, that, that's not viable because eventually the people who are selling us stuff want to get paid. And when they realize that, hey, we can't pay, and you know, we're, we're, America is happy to continue to charade indefinitely. You know, you keep sending us stuff, and we'll pretend that we can pay for it. But at some point, you know, that vendor financing is going to come to an end, especially when the vendors realize that they're not really financing, they're giving. Right? The world is giving us stuff, because if we're never going to pay for it, then it's a gift. And I think most people, you know, it's not charity. The, the, you know, the Chinese aren't sending stuff here because they're feeling charitable. You know, they think they're getting paid. I mean, we got them, we, we, we got them con, but, you know, they're waking up. <laughs> I, I know you can't give specific investment advice, but uh, what would you? What are you telling your your U.S. clients right now? Are you? I mean, when you, you're very good at, at, at pointing to the problem, but what's the solution for U.S. Well, I tell my U.S. clients without, without getting into yeah, well, to divest. If I think the dollar is going to go down, I don't want to own dollars. I don't want to own any U.S. debt. I tell people to buy gold. I tell people to buy silver. I tell people to buy natural resources, uh, commodities, and stocks. I, I invest money all around the world to get out of the U.S. One place is Canada. We have exposure to Canadian, you know, resource companies, uh, mining companies, oil and gas companies, uh, even you know, just we own REITs up here, you know, utilities up here. Uh, I own bonds. I own Canadian bonds for clients, but that's a small part of the overall portfolio. <coughs> we've got money in Scandinavia. We've got money in Australia, and New Zealand. We've got money in Southeast Asia. So, you know, so we have so money in Europe. If, if the U.S. collapses, like you're predicting, wouldn't it have, wouldn't have a, a worldwide effect, and all yes. all values would collapse? And well, no. I mean, I, if I think the dollar is going to collapse, it's going to collapse against other currencies. Yeah. It's not. So you know, so the dollar. So if you have money in other currencies, you're going to be better off if the dollar loses value relative to those currencies. Now, what you're saying is, if the U.S. stock market collapses, would that bring down other stock markets? Probably, but to what degree, and then how quickly might they recover? But I'm not necessarily thinking the U.S. stock market is going to collapse. I think in real terms it will, but in terms of dollars it won't. Nominally, U.S. stocks could go up even as their real value is imploding. The, the, the Dow has lost over 70% of its value in the last 10 years if you price it in gold. The Dow has gone from 40 ounces of gold or to seven, or less than seven, and it was over 40. That's going to continue. But I also think that the global economy net is going to be better off after the U.S. collapses than before. Because I think the real problem for the U.S. economy is the cost of propping us up. I think all of the resources that are having to be diverted from productive economies to America to finance its consumption, that is the burden that the world is bearing. And I think if the world stops doing that, I mean, imagine if we weren't selling, you know, two, three trillion dollars worth of treasuries every year. Imagine if the world had all that money back, that instead of buying all these treasuries, they did something else with that money. So how, what, what, what would that do? How much better off would countries be if they invested that money productively in their own economies rather than loaning it to the U.S. government to squander it? But imagine how much better off consumers in other countries would be if their currencies rose in value so that oil prices were coming down, food prices were coming down. See, prices are going up all around the world. If the dollar collapsed for some people, prices would be coming down. And so, you know, their standard of living would be rising. So I think the world is going to be better off. Are there going to be certain companies that will suffer? 
Yes, of course, there are companies that are doing almost all their business uh, in America. And if Americans are too broke to buy their products, or they're already too broke, but if they lose the subsidy, which enables them to pretend that they're not broke, then yes, yeah, some companies are going to suffer. But some of those companies will retool. You know, maybe there's a company in China that's making American flags. Okay, so they start making Chinese flags. You know, maybe they'll, they'll and if they and if the Chinese don't want flags, then you know they'll make something else. You know, the, the machines and things. You know, when you have a factory, when you're producing stuff, you can retool. You don't have to make exactly what you're making now. You make a little bit of an investment. You know, in, in, in America, during the Second World War, our factories were going three shifts a day, and all they were producing was bombs and, and, and tanks and planes and ammunition and all sorts of stuff for the war. Meanwhile, American citizens couldn't buy anything. Everything was rationed. There was nothing to buy because all of the factories, all the raw material was producing stuff that exploded. Right, so there was nothing for consumers. Well, when the war ended, it wasn't like we had a complete economic collapse because you know the factories shut down because there was nobody buying their bombs anymore. In fact, there were actually economists that argued that we couldn't end the war because it would collapse the economy because we had a wartime economy. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, the economy boomed when the war ended. In fact, that's when the Depression ended. People think that the Depression ended when we started World War II. No, it ended when we finished World War II because then government spending collapsed. And now all those factories didn't have to make bombs anymore. They could retool and make sewing machines and refrigerators and washer dryers and automobiles and, st and stuff that consumers actually benefited from. So the same thing is going to happen in China. The Chinese have all these factories making products for Americans. You don't think they can make products for the Chinese? It's the same thing. And where, is, where are the Chinese better off? Making products for us or making products for themselves? Clearly, they're better off. You know, people say, well, there's no demand in China. That's nonsense. You think some guy, in, you know, some Chinese guy in a factory, and let's say he's making dishwashers, and he goes home at night and he washes dishes by hand, you don't think he wants one of those dishwashers? <laughs> of course. Why doesn't he buy it? Because he can't afford it because his currency is too low. Well, stop, you know, let the currency go up and he'll buy it. You know, and, and that's what happens. I mean, people buy things as prices go down. You get this nonsense all the time from the government that, oh, we can't have deflation because no one will buy anything if prices fall. That's nonsense. Falling prices creates demand. That's the reason we have things. I mean, everybody in this room has a cell phone. You know, did everybody have one when they first came out with 2020, when the first one was like $2,000 and it was like this big? <laughs> but somebody bought it. Yeah, somebody wanted to be the guy say, hey, look what I got. I got this $2,000 phone. And, you know, but how many people would have bought cell phones if the price kept going up from there? The reason that we all got them is because the price came down. Same thing when plasma TVs came out, they were like 10 grand, 20 grand for a TV. Who bought that first TV? Bill Gates? Somebody bought it. But most people didn't buy it because it was too expensive. But as the price came down, more and more people bought. And that argument that, well, no one is going to buy because if you wait, it'll be cheaper. No, because there is a utility in having something now. If somebody simply said, oh, I'm not going to buy a, a, a laptop computer because next year it'll be cheaper. Okay, so what are you going to do for the next year? Have no computer? No, I mean, you, you want to have it now. I mean, you, every, we all buy stuff knowing that if we wait, it would be cheaper because we don't want to wait. The only reason you're waiting is because you can't afford it. It's like, gee, I would love to get that laptop computer, but I can't afford to pay 2000 So you wait. And, and that's the beauty of capitalism. It brings costs down. And companies, they say, oh, companies will never make money during deflation. The, 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 uh, the television companies are making a lot more money selling plasma TVs at 600 bucks or 700 bucks than they were at $10,000. Why? Because of the volume and because of the margins. Because as you sell products at a higher price and you get money, you reinvest it into more efficient ways of producing and you bring down the costs. And as you bring down the cost, you bring down price. And as you bring down price, you create demand. So it's the exact opposite of what the Keynesians say, that we need inflation, that people won't buy anything unless they think it's going to go up. I mean, think about any, any kind of merchant, any store. What does a store do if they have a lot of stuff and they want to sell it? They have a sale. Right? They don't say, hey, we got a lot of extra merchandise. Let's mark it up. <laughs> yeah, then people, here's where I'll tell my customers, I'm going to mark everything up 20%, and you better hurry up, because if you don't buy now, I'm going to mark it up 30%. <laughs> and that's, no, really, no, you cut the price, and people come in, 
And if prices went down in China, and that's exactly what happens when the RMB goes up, that means prices come down. Prices come down and more people buy. Deflation is fantastic. That's what we had in America uh, for over 100 years until the Fed came in and screwed it all up. Got time for one last, one, one last question. One of the turning points in the United States was when Nixon came up with gold standard, and you mentioned the gold standard as being something that is desirable, but do you actually think that America will never get back to gold standard? Yes, uh, we will eventually. Uh, the world will eventually. I mean, the, the countries have experimented with fiat money in the past, and it's never worked. You know, people think that it is a progressive idea. It's not. The founding fathers rejected it when they formed America. They put us on a gold standard because they understood how bad fiat money was. So when people say, hey, we don't want to go back to the gold, to the gold standard, no, it's going forward to the gold standard. What we're on now is, is something that has failed every time it's been tried. And this is a gigantic global experiment. It's been 40 years, and it's, a, it's an abysmal failure. So we will go back on the gold standard. The only question is when, you know, and, and what's the price of gold going to be? The longer we wait, the higher the price is going to be. Um, um, but it's going to happen, and if governments, if governments do not adopt the gold standard, citizens will do it on their own. And I can tell you what I've already done. I set up a bank in the Caribbean, and I'm the first one to do this, but I'm not going to be the last. But people who have an account with me at my bank, Europe Pacific Bank Limited, uh, they can hold their gold through me. I'll store it through, I, we have a, a, an agreement with uh, Perth Mint in Australia, so I will store your gold, but when you open up an account, I send you a MasterCard, a debit card, and that debit card gives you access to your gold. And, 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 and people think, well, you know, gold is great for money, it's a good store of value, well, how do I spend it? Well, this debit card lets you do that, because you take my debit card into a store, and you, know, you're, you can spend your gold as easy, you can swipe that card. And you can buy merchandise with it, or you can, uh, you can take cash out of an ATM machine. So people can get on the gold standard themselves. They can save gold, they can spend gold, and if central banks are gonna keep interest rates at zero and have this race to the bottom, and that's what we have now, a global currency war, right? And the object of a currency war is to commit suicide, right? It's the only war where the object is to kill yourself. And so all the countries are fighting to see who can destroy their currency the fastest. And if that is the war, well, the people aren't gonna want it. You're not going to want to save a currency where your government is telling you that at the end of the year it's going to be worth a lot less than it is at the beginning of the year. So more and more people are going to want to own gold. And with the technology that we have today, with a debit card and computers, you, know, you can spend your gold almost as easily as you can spend your paper. And the people that you're transacting with don't know the difference. But you know the difference. Because if, if currencies are going down, let's say, 20% a year, and you're store, you have your money with me, your bank deposits are growing every year. And so for you, prices are coming down. So your neighbors could be complaining, hey, you know, look at prices are 10% higher than they were last year. But for you, they could be 10% lower because you're paying in gold. And so when you buy something, you can think in terms of how much gold does this cost? Because the price of everything has been falling in terms of gold for 10 years. And it's probably going to continue. So, you know, if you want to put yourself on a gold standard, there's nothing that stops it. Now, sometimes there's tax laws and governments kind of get in the way. But eventually, they're not going to be able to stop this. And, and they're going to be forced to go back on a gold standard because the people will demand it. Uh, but, and, and, the, and the main reason that the politicians object to a gold standard is because under a gold standard, there's discipline. Under a gold standard, you can't run deficits. Under a gold standard, you can't put interest rates at 1%. It doesn't work. Gold keeps the, the banks honest. It keeps the government honest. That's why the government always wants to get rid of a gold standard. It's like, you know, it's like high school kids at a prom. They don't want the chaperone there. They're going to try to, you know. But, you know, we want the chaperone there because we know what a bunch of high school kids and a bunch of alcohol are going to do if there's nobody chaperoning them. Well, that's the same thing as ever. What are our politicians going to do if there's no chaperone? You know? And so that's what the politicians are never going to do it on their own. The people are going to have to demand it. They're going to have to force the issue. And a, and a monetary crisis, a sovereign debt crisis in America could be the very thing that would force, force that issue on, on American politicians. And if we go back on a gold standard, so everybody's going to go back on a gold standard. But we don't have to be the first one to adopt it. Other countries can unilaterally go back on a gold standard. Yeah. Thank you, Peter, for uh, your presentation. <laughs>